Hello and welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me in another of my interviews. Today, I'm in the kitchen with the lovely Julia and our special guest, Dr. Sarah Myhill. Hello. Can Richard, we call you Sarah? You, of course you can. Thank you for welcoming me. This is a lovely place. Oh, uh, thank you so much. I'm we so wanted excited to have you come around. <laughs> we were so keen to talk to you because we'd seen some YouTube videos that you appeared in a few years ago, um, probably during that rather awful time that we've um, all lived through. And we were so taken away with some of the simple remedies that you had for just dealing with ordinary, or perhaps not so ordinary, um, infections and problems like that. And then we knew we were going to meet you at the Better Way conference, which we did, so we were able to sort of tackle you there <laughs> and ask you. I pounced you, didn't yeah. I? I think I tackled you, actually. No, I pounced you. I, pounced you. I, saw, I was looking out for you all day and I saw you coming in. I was like, <gasps> Sarah! So, so, yeah, so we've done a little bit of investigation on, on who you are and what you do, and we're thoroughly impressed. And one of the things... We've both went out and purchased are these, which I are, can't remember what they're actually called now. They're salt pipes. Salt pipes, that's but it. We have a, our own little somewhat silly name because yeah. we call them snoot pipes. Snoot pipes. Perfect. And they're full of Himalayan salt. Correct. But we put in. Oh, I didn't bring it on the table. But we put in the iodine. Iodine. Fantastic. A couple of drops of that, and we yeah. do all that. <laughs> Lovely. Fantastic. So, could you tell us? Why and what's that about? Because <laughs> we understand that, but we, we want to really share that. Well, with you, uh, really. something I've been using for some time, but it, I became aware this is going to be a very useful treatment for any viral infection. The iodine is volatile, so use Lugol's iodine, which uh, comes up into the, in the atmosphere, and when we sniff it, uh, we get a therapeutic dose because 10 parts per million contact kills all microbes. Wow. Nothing um, is resistant to iodine. And in a volatile form, which can be easily applied, that's going to massively reduce the loading dose of any infection. Because what determines the severity of an infection is not just the immune defense of the body, which of course are critical, but also the loading dose. And if you can get the loading dose low, that means the number of microbes as they're breeding in the body breed, uh, build up very slowly, and therefore the immune system can get ahead of the game. Wow, okay. And, and the, the, what's the, the salt itself doing? That's just the delivery mechanism. So now, is it carried on the... No, there's, there's a little bit of salt carried, but this was, the salt pipe was uh, developed by a Polish uh, doctor who noticed that the miners working in the coal mines had terrible lungs and the miners working in the salt mines had great lung function. And so he used to use the salt pipe to help the miners in the, in the um, coal mines. Right. But uh, what makes it really work brilliantly well and it's been long recognized the treatment for asthma for example sniffing uh -huh. salt and, and part of the reasons why asthmatics often feel better living on the coast is because yeah. you know, there's salt in the air and salt slightly breaks down and liquefies secretions and mucus so it's easier to cough up ah. but the iodine is so important because of its antimicrobial properties and the point is when somebody has an acute infection initially you don't know is it a virus you know yeah, yeah is it a bacteria what sort of viruses is it a fungal you don't know but it doesn't matter with iodine it contact kills the lot. Right. Yeah. And I now have five patients with chronic obstructive airways disease, bronchiectasis. And those patients normally go from one dose of antibiotic and they're a bit better and then they get sick and then another dose of antibiotic and a de da de da de da. Now by dint of putting in place all the regimes that we're going to talk about, the diet, the supplements, the vitamin C and sniffing the iodine, their need for antibiotics has dropped to zero. Oh. Wow. And they are now well all the time. And they're now confident they're going to live to a great age. Because, um, in fact, there was one lady, when, when she was 60, I've been seeing her, from, she's from Mansfield, uh, she was told by her GP she'd only got six months to live. You know, oh my would I ever tell anybody that? Of course, never. And I said to her at the time, Margaret, that is nonsense. And by doing all this stuff, she's now in her mid-80s and functioning at a high level. Oh, that is incredible. So it's cheap, cheerful, simple medicine. And is there any risk with iodine? Can you take too much of it? Virtually impossible, because iodine uh, is not well stored in the body and it's all too easily excreted in urine. Uh, and throughout the world, we are all deficient. It is iodine deficiency is the single most common cause of mental retardation or mental deficiency or intellectual impairment in the world. Oh, really? Yeah. It's massive. It's vital for our so, immune systems. Yeah. So, for, I mean, my father had dementia and he I, I, and I was trying to work out what that might be. And as he and his partner got older, they were doing more sort of 
supermarket dinners and things like that. And I thought, well, maybe it's they're just not getting the right minerals and all of that. Um, but they, he, he did take a few simple supplements like um, vitamin B, I thought. But I was no, aware that no iodine and, and all of those sort of things. So, Well, iodine is part of the story. Yeah. There's a lovely website set up by Patrick Holford called Food for the Brain. And uh, he has uh, developed a fantastic research program with lots of good professors on board. And essentially, dementia is 99% preventable. Gosh. And it is, can be completely prevented through a combination of a low-carbohydrate diet, B vitamins and sorting out your homocysteine, um, and taking fish oils. They are the three key things. Wow. Get all that in place. Your risk of dementia can be predicted in your 30s from your homocysteine level. Homocysteine is a marker of poor methylation. And without methylation, you can't make neurotransmitters, you can't heal and repair. It's a vital biochemical tool. And it tends to increase with age. So um, I can reverse dementia with simple nutritional interventions that cost very little. Wow, that, that, I mean, that's, I mean, you know, the amount of care homes that we have where we are in Worthing and the amount of people that are going into them and you think, just fr from what you've just said, that all can be preventable. I mean, one can't help feeling that there might be a business um, incentive along these lines, but I didn't say that, of course. Um, th the other thing that you were mentioning in, in these early videos um, was salt and its importance. And, and one of the things, of course, that we've been told time and time again through the mainstream media is salt is bad for you. And yet, if you think back to our history, we used to eat loads of fish, which must have had salt in it, of Correct. course. Correct. And, um, and, and what I found actually quite interesting was living in a seaside town, in a, in a Victorian seaside town, and some of these other Georgian seaside towns, People went here to take the sea air, but they used to drink a pint of seawater. And everyone thought that was barking. <laughs> but now I'm beginning to realise that the reason behind all of that. Well, um, you're absolutely right. And on, I mean, the first trade um, in primitive uh, uh, England, in primitive Britain, was the salt trade. Yes. And of course, you know, Roman salaries that weren't worth were paid in salt. You know, they, if, uh, Roman soldiers were, were paid in salt. And if they weren't up to um, their their grade, they were considered to be below the salt. So salt is an absolute essential. The problem is it tastes delicious. Obviously, we have taste buds for salt. And processed food is, is full of salt to try to give it some flavour. But people doing a paleoketogenic diet, which is the evolutionary correct diet, do need that extra salt. But there's another problem with modern diets, and that's because of modern agriculture. And essentially, there is a one movement of minerals from the soil into plants, into animals, into us, and we throw it away. So our, all our soils are becoming deficient in minerals, by which I mean calcium, magnesium, potassium, zinc, copper, selenium, chromium, you know, boron, molybdenum, and so on. And, um, and that's a long list. That, is a, long, that you... is a long list. And they are all essential for um, mammal metabolism. We all need those minerals. A deficiency in any one of those will result in disease. So um, as part of my basic workup for treating absolutely anybody, yes, we need to a paleoketogenic diet, but we also need to take some nutritional supplements. Now, all, most of my patients are not wealthy people. Yeah. I want to provide them with interventions that are cheap, affordable, sustainable, and can be applied to the whole family. So I decided to, I, and I looked at the market, and I couldn't find a mineral preparation on the market that had all the minerals in that I wanted to see, in a form that's soluble, um, in decent doses and in the correct proportion. So I decided to make my own. Right. And I started off making this with a concrete mixer in my kitchen. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I got, uh, uh, ordering you know, minerals from Celtic chemicals and making up the mixes. And then when the demand got uh, high, then of course I sourced it out. But the sunshine salt, it's, it's, it's four fifths salt, which is, I use molten sea salt, which is my favorite, which is delicious. But all the rest is made up of these essential minerals. So by dint of taking the sunshine salt, you can get good dose of calcium, magnesium, potassium, zinc, copper, selenium, chrome, boron, molybdenum, di-da, di-da, di-da. And I also put a healthy dollop of vitamin D in there. 
wow. 5,000 of your vitamin D, and 5,000 uh, uh, micrograms of vitamin B12 in the methylated form because everybody is deficient. And both those vitamins are heat soluble. So you can cook with this, you can put it in your um, uh, paleo keto bread, uh, you can put it in your French dressing, you can sprinkle on your food. It tastes delicious. I, I apologise, I haven't bought a bottle today, no, no. today for you. Um, but it's a very good way of, of replacing minerals um, um, uh, in a very inexpensive form. Mm. And all of those will be on, you've got a website presumably yes, where you sell yes. all that. Yeah. So we'll, we'll put that in the description because I'm Bless sure it. people will, well, Bless I'm it. sure people will be <laughs> interested in getting some. Well, it's very, trying it, you know. It's very it's cheap. Like... I pretty much do it at cost. So a large pot costs £15. I looked into the business of marketing it through one of the supermarkets. And when they said, oh, by the time we promoted this and spent money on advertising, it'll go out about £35 a pot. Gosh. And I said, no way, Jose, I'll just keep it yeah. low input, low output, and because it's got to be affordable for people who are sick and need it. So one of the things we we, we do with the because we're using Celtic sea salt um, <clears throat> tend to try and get about half a teaspoon of that into us a day and we take a pinch and, and put it with water because I watched this Australian lady whose name I can't remember off the top of my head who was saying half the time when you drink water it goes straight through it's not getting into the cell but the salt is what helps it get in. That's absolutely right. And there's a chapter about this in the cookbook because if we go back to O-level biology, um, uh, and remember that word osmosis, oh, yeah. to hold water in cells, we need um, uh, good quality cell membranes and we need salt and we need water. So to be properly hydrated, yes, we need all those three things. And most people are horribly deficient in fats and oils mm. uh, and deficient in, in, in salts as well. In fact, uh, the worst nourished people I've seen are those who think it's a good idea to drink three or four litres of water a day. And they drink it and they drink it and they drink it. Well, you can drink pure water, but you cannot pee pure water. Mm. And you would simply wash out the minerals in your body and oh, render yourself gosh. markedly deficient. Oh, yes. That's fascinating. I've um, never thought about it. Like no, that. And, and because we filter our water and we were said, well, of course, you're filtering out all everything out of that. So you need to replenish all of those things, which is why we, we, why we, we use we, the salt. We, we use the salt uh, and we take some supplements from our friend Clive de Carl, uh, magnesium. Uh, we, we also actually do two drops of um, iodine in water. Better and better. And so we take that and and, and a number of others that he, he has. So um, we're doing the best we can. The other thing, just to, to finish on, on the, those videos that introduced us to you, was the, the vitamin C. Yes. And I was fascinated really to know that, and there's that lovely term that we, we enjoy, bowel tolerance. Well, bowel tolerance, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> you, you, brain blank. Brain blank. Um, that you can, if, it, you should have a certain amount every day anyway, but the, the, the hint of a, a a virus or something like yes. that you take a hell of a lot more correct and you know when you've had too much because you end up with the squids correct yes. correct but you don't have to do that to get on the right dose immediately right so um uh, the reason that we have to take such big doses of vitamin c is because we are one of the only mammals that can't make its own vitamin c ah. right so my little dog nancy who lives on a carnivore diet she can generate her own vitamin c goats well all other mammals effectively and when they are ill, they will generate up to maybe 15,000 milligrams or maybe 20,000 milligrams of vitamin C to deal with that infection. And we don't do that. We can't do that. We lost that ability, you know, um, uh, some millions of years ago in evolution. So we do need vitamin C and we need it in gram amounts. Now, the recommended daily amount, which is 30 milligrams, might stop you from getting scurvy but it is not sufficient for optimal biochemical and immunological performance. So my view is we should all take about a teaspoon of vitamin C powder a day, which is about five grams. And when you get the dose right, you should have no gut symptoms whatsoever. Issues arise with an acute infection, and it doesn't matter what that acute infection is. And this was worked out by Robert Cathcart, Frederick Klenner, who literally treated thousands of people with vitamin C with a whole range of infectious diseases because there is a time element. When we get infected with something, and 90% of infections um, end up in the stomach, either because we inhale them, sticky mucus coughed up and swallowed, or because we drink them or because we eat them. Right. So we want that big dose of vitamin C in the stomach because vitamin C, like iodine, contact kills all microbes. 
And if you get a big infectious dose of something, and it might be a set of food or a virus or whatever, then it will grow very rapidly in the body. And so we want to kill it as fast as we possibly can. So I recommend people take 10 at the first hint of any infection, doesn't matter what that hint is. Again, one of my favourite quotes is Frederick Klenner. You know, in the event of any infection, take large dose of vitamin C whilst the physician ponders the diagnosis. Right. Don't <coughs> wait, get on with it. So 10 grams of vitamin C, two teaspoons in, maybe half a pint of water, drunk back every hour. Every hour? Every hour. Now you might think, oh gosh, that's a big dose, but you'll soon quickly work out if you've arrived at it. Because mm. the nastier the viral infection, like a severe flu or COVID in the early days or Epstein-Barr virus. Some people need 100 or 150 grams or 200 grams every 24 hours before they get to bowel tolerance and to get rid of the virus. And I've heard that you can um, put vitamin C into the body via a drip. You can, but that's just not necessary. Right. Uh, I mean, who has access to intravenous vitamin well, C at the first hint of the Yes, I mean, no, you wouldn't want to do <coughs> you're, that. You're absolutely right, and this is work um, that's done by Paul Marrick, who ran a, uh, uh, an IT, a, a special care um, uh, centre in uh, America, specifically for people with septicemia and um, you know, serious yeah, infectious yeah. disease. The prognosis with septicemia is 40% will die, even with the best care steroids, um, um, uh, antibiotics, oxygen, the, the works. When he started adding vitamin C into his regimes, the mortality dropped below 1%. Good God. And he makes the point, and he's quite right, that most people, if, when they, well, every person, when they die with an infectious disease, they're dying from scurvy. They simply don't have the vitamin C um, to fight the infection. People think that you get enough vitamin C if you have an orange or um, a lemon or, you know, citrus fruit. I understand that's not actually true. It's enough to stop you from getting scurvy, but it is not sufficient for your best, you know, possible health, your your, your most robust immune system, your best biochemistry. So, um, as I say, they won't get scurvy, and we know that from uh, experience of the in the ships in the, in the, ship, in, the yes. in, 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 in uh, Nelson's time. But that is not sufficient um, uh, in the modern world. Right. So, so you've got to get yourself a jar of this. You've got to get yourself a jar of that. And thankfully, it's cheap. You know, I specialise in interventions which are inexpensive, safe, multitasking, potential harm virtually zero, not needed on prescription, accessible to all. And they should become incorporated in your everyday life. Mm -hmm. So there's something very rare about Dr. Sarah Myhill, who is uh, firstly rare for us to have <laughs> such an em eminent guest oh, yeah. here. But the, but the other thing is that... Um, you, you said right at the beginning about your patients, you asked them what their diet was. And my experience going to doctors with the children when they were younger, or indeed in my case, is that's not a question that's asked. It's straight to the symptoms and then it's straight to a very quick piece of Symptom paper. Symptom suppressing medication. Yeah. Correct. I mean, you know, sometimes I have to say I'm ashamed to be a member of the medical profession because they are not asking the question why. And that's, the, that's what everyone wants to know. I mean, I qualified in 1981, went straight into general practice and um, thought I knew it all. You know, recently educated, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, my patients come and say, you know, why have I got migraine? You know, why have I got arthritis? And I had to admit, I didn't know. I didn't have a clue. No. And, but you uh, could and give them a drug. I could give them a drug, but they knew it was symptom suppression. Yeah. Uh, they knew it was short-term gain, long-term pain. Uh, and they knew that they'd get be on one drug and then another for the side effects of that, and another for the side effects of that, until they... Gets got some devastating illness. So drugs are not the solution. The, the problem with the drug companies is the first lot of drugs they came up, which were the antibiotics, were magical. I wouldn't want to practice medicine without you know, antibiotics and antimicrobials. They are fantastically useful drugs. But then it's been downhill ever since. Yes. Uh, but people now want the magic bullet. They want the quick, easy way to uh, a result, not the, you've got to change your diet, you've got to take these supplements, you've got to be disciplined about your sleep, you've got to take more exercise, you've got to lose weight, or whatever. All the simple stuff that we all know, mm. it's so obvious that that's got to be the way forward. Mm. And talking about changing your diet, we, we now come on to your, you've got a series of books out, and you're very much into, and I'm going to make sure I pronounce this correctly, <laughs> Paleo ketogenic diet, <laughs> well and um, I have to say, I've not been anybody who's followed any specific diet because I've always heard from people who say, "Oh, I've tried this diet and that didn't work," you know, and they've gone through 
like I suppose you know members of family have gone through different diets and they've they've all ended up back where they were for some reason so I've been slightly nervous about different diets we generally in more recent times just eat moderately we we got off bread mostly any bread <coughs> great start I make myself but I I now source heritage, heritage grains and, grains, yeah. and it's very occasional uh, it's much heavier stuff so <laughs> one slice <laughs> fills fills you up for a start we've got a, so I mean I can't remember the last time I made a loaf <laughs> Um, but I do, you know, it is a useful a bit of bread with a nugget of cheese, and I know cheese is a it's bit delicious. of a, yeah, yeah. But you know, it's a useful carrier for something, as long as you're not having it every day, or going to these dreadful Mother's Pride type right. bread that is the Charlie the Chorley wood process that's just yes, got yes. nothing in it, and of course that dreadful white modern. Uh, wheat that's rollered rather than stone ground, all of that. Um, so, could you tell us a little bit about it? We've got your books here, okay. we may as well flash them up oh, on the screen. Um, <laughs> uh, where, whichever, whichever camera is the best. Uh, we'll put a list on the, on the thing. Yes. Can you tell us what the advantage is and, and where it sort of stems okay. from? Whenever I have a difficult question in medicine or lifestyle or whatever, I always go back to first principles and that's evolutionary biology. And we have to ask ourselves, what diet did primitive woman evolve consuming? And the answer is she ate um, a paleo, ketogenic diet. A paleo because there were no dairy products uh, and there were no gluten grains. And ketogenic because it was, it was necessarily low in carbohydrates. It was meat, fish, eggs um, uh, and very high in fibre. Now in the autumn there would have been... Um, a bonanza would have been a windfall of free food, fruit, nuts, seeds, grains, and uh, she would have eaten them, and she'd have eaten them in an addictive way, which meant, because the thing about sugars and carbohydrates is we eat them, we can't stop eating them yes. once that addictive thing, and she'd have got fat. And that's survival value for the winter, because right. people used to die in the winter from starvation. Mm. And the fatter you can become in the autumn, the better able you are to survive that winter. It's insulating, the more reserves you've got, correct. Now, to, in order to make primitive woman uh, eat in an addictive way, we, we develop carbohydrate addiction. We have a carbohydrate addiction gene that's switched on by eating lots of, of sugars and carbohydrates. So when the banana tree ripened, we'd eat bananas and eat bananas and eat bananas until we got fat, you know, ditto nuts, ditto seeds. So, so, but the, of course, when autumn came to an end, those foods were no longer present. And so the carbohydrate addiction gene ceased and was switched off simply because we had to. Yes. But now we live in, a, in a, uh, a, a period of time where those foods are available all year round. The gene is never switched off. And so we continue to eat like that all year round. Hence our Western epidemics of obesity and hypertension and cancer and dementia and heart disease, which are all carbohydrate driven pathologies. So it's not a no carbohydrate diet, it's a low carbohydrate diet. Essentially, we should be fueling our body with fat and with fibre. They are the, the staples. The protein content is the same. And yes, there are some carbohydrates. And the way I like people to do it is to test if they're in ketosis with a breath meter. And if you're in ketosis, that tells us we are fat burning once a day, then I'm a happy bunny. Now, some people are very physically active, will need some carbohydrates to, to power that, but so long as they're burning it off as fast as they're consuming it, that's totally acceptable. Right. But of course, I tend to deal with people who are sick, who don't have any energy, uh, who aren't burning off their carbohydrates, and therefore their um, diet has necessary to be low in carbohydrates in order to achieve that state of ketosis once a day. So what foods, <laughs> natural foods, uh, rather than the processed stuff, mm -hmm. is carbohydrates that we which we ought to avoid too much of? Well, it's grains, oh, they're all high in carbohydrate. It's fruits, which are many are very high in sugar. Um, it, some pulses are a bit high in, in carbohydrate. Uh, root vegetables, of course, potato and parsnip. Now, that doesn't mean I eat no potatoes. I adore potatoes. I'm a gardener, I grow them. But what I do is I parboil them, let them cool down, and then you get a resistant starch, and then I fry them in my in fat, coconut oil or um, pig fat or whatever. And I make the most delicious chips in the world. But they're Sounds huge. Sounds like we're going to come over to your place sometime. Oh, you better come and have some, some chips. <laughs> they're, they're hugely satisfying. And so I only need three or four. Right. And, and, and I feel full, it satisfies, and that's all I need. Ah, okay. Because I was, I was worried about potatoes because people said, oh yes, you know that they, you can't have those. 
And, and we love our potatoes too. And we too. do love potatoes. And of course they are very much a staple of a lot of people's Correct. Um, food. And you think, golly, what do you do to re replace all of that? It Presumably it's quite a hard task to go from, let's say, an average meat and two veg type thing, um, which may or may not be meat and two veg that's actually farm <laughs> shop or um, organic or actually got the minerals in it. It may be just your supermarket meat and two veg or whatever, uh, or pastas and things like that, which are, is a grain, of course, mm -hmm. to go to your diet. So what steps do you say to people to get there? Well, it depends how ill they are. Right. Uh, so um, there's a second reason for doing this diet, which is allergy because um, allergic symptoms are common. Asthma, chronic rhinitis, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, arthritis, these are all allergy-driven conditions. And, uh, so the, and the major allergens are the dairy products and the gluten grains. So they're usually not too difficult to cut out. I mean, dairy products, there are lots of fantastic dairy substitutes. Um, so, I mean, when I first, I, I'm dairy allergic myself. And so I learned Well, that about must help because I love cheese. <laughs> well, <laughs> cheese is, well, if you are absolutely certain that you are not dairy allergic, and that's another story, then the safest dairy to eat is butter, and cheese in moderation would be fine. The most dangerous dairy product you consume is semi-skimmed milk. Ah, mm. uh, yes. Why? Because it's high in sugar and it's high in protein, and, and the, the safest bit of dairy product is the fat. It's low in fat. So, um, so butter is absolutely fine and, and totally desirable for a paleoketogenic diet. And of course, if you're, again, if you're not allergic to dairy, then occasional consumption is fine. Right. But when it comes a staple, then there are problems because we know high levels of dairy consumption is a risk factor for cancer, for heart disease and osteoporosis. And we can do without those three nasty NDNs. And cream? Well, that's high in fat, so that gets the thumbs up. And it's difficult to have a lot of cream. Yes. But again, it still has the protein in there, which is growth promoting and makes for sticky blood. Um, uh, so it's, you know, occasional is fine. Yes. But my problem is I'm an addict. And one of the interesting things about allergy and addiction is they're two sides of the same coin. And if I'm trying to diagnose what somebody is allergic to, very often, if I ask them what they have for breakfast, that gives the game away. And they say, yes, I like Weetabix with lots of milk on. Well, it's going to be wheat and milk, isn't it? Yes. If it's, oh, it's a big glass of orange juice, well, it's going to be sugar. And if it's, oh, I can't get going without two pints of coffee, then it's going to be coffee. Mm. So um, if I have a little bit of cream, you know, I want it all. Now, thankfully, coconut cream is an identical fat as succulent and as delicious, but doesn't have the problem with growth promoters. So if I want a cream substitute, I use coconut cream, and it's absolutely divine. Oh, right. We'll have to, we'll have to look into that. I'll bring you some. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> so, yes, I, so years ago, got off cereals. Um, Good start. D do occasionally in the winter have porridge, which, of course, is oats and milk. <laughs> so presumably you'll say not well, too much of that. In, in the Paleo Ketogenic Cookbook, there are some alternatives. And the, the, the perfect grain is linseed, because linseed is only 2% carbohydrate and it's high in fibre. And in the PK Cookbook, there are recipes where you can make a very acceptable linseed bread. We've watched a video of yours doing oh, that. Oh, that's the, my Delia with Smith your Act. Very <laughs> precise measurements. Correct. And that's a the blender key. of some Don't worry, I got her every morning for about six months and experimented with different this and that and, and eggs. And I wanted something um, for my patients who don't have the time, the energy, or the inclination. It had to be very simple. Yeah. Uh, so now I make uh, linseed bread very regularly. Uh, and there's also a recipe in there for linseed porridge or for linseed based muesli, which is low carb. Uh, and in, and with the coconut milk and it's got that succulence, that smoothness, it's absolutely delicious. So one of the things that I wanted to sort of touch base on you then is we've talked about health in general, sort of physical health and eating. One of the things I've found by eating more holistically and wholesome foods is the mind is clearer, less foggy and, sorry about the flies, um, <laughs> And also that sort of sense of our spirituality and things like that, which a lot of people are now openly and happily talking about, which is, which is really uh, great. So could you just tell us how food also clears 
clears your mind and your 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 indeed yeah well personally it's the gut <laughs> that's, that's absolutely <laughs> <clear>. absolutely <laughs> that's what we're coming to i'm afraid <laughs> but um uh one of the problems with high carbohydrate and high sugar diets is you overwhelm the ability of the upper gut to become sterile now the human gut is is almost unique in the mammal world because the upper gut is a sterile digesting gut to deal with meat and fat that's the first 20 odd foot of our gut. The lower gut, the last three foot, that's where the microbiome is. That's where we deal with fiber. Now, if you eat a lot of carbohydrates and sugars, you overwhelm the ability of the upper gut to be sterile. Mm. And the bacteria and the yeast move in and you end up with a fermenting gut, an upper fermenting gut. Now, that creates a whole heap of problems. And number one is you ferment sugars to produce alcohol, delactate, hydrogen sulfide, ammoniacal compounds, and these all poison the brain. Mm. Ah. And that is the major source of the foggy brain. It's, called, it's also called the autobrewery syndrome. And this was written up in a paper published in the journal Nutritional Medicine in the 1990s, where um, it was Stephen Davis and John McLaren Howard, they measured levels of sugar and alcohol in the bloodstream before and after a, a sugar load and the alcohol levels rose up quite markedly. The highest result was 19 milligrams per deciliter, wow. which is not far off drunk driving. Mm. So yes, you get a foggy brain. So people having a glass of orange juice for breakfast, you know, will be uh, slightly inebriated by nine or 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, there you go. <laughs> well, there we are. Well, th thank you for that. Um, I want to ask um, a question that came in from one of our uh, audience because they heard that you were coming in and they said, oh, do, would you mind? So here is, here is the question. Doctor, a doctor diagnosed ME to him in 1998 after six months of glandular fever oh, that's a classic. and offered no medical advice whatsoever on how to treat it. Thank you for the work that you do, for giving people like him hope and a vision of a better life ahead. And thank you for giving me my life back. And, and he's gone out and bought one of your books. He started keto on June the 1st this year at 18 stone. Today he's 17 stone, three pounds. So where are we? Um, about a month and... Yeah, that's perfect. That's, that's not perfect even a rate. month. Okay. A perfect rate of loss. Should I stay away from carbs? I think you sort of mentioned that now. E.g. root vegetables for good. Or can I introduce a small amount in meals, which you've sort of covered um, for breakfast I'm co cooking in raw milk butter directly from the farm but I'm worried about the amount of bacon when thinking about a report a few years ago which stated that bacon can be carcinogenic what is your typical main meal um, and that's his question. Well, ba bacon is only carcinogenic if the nitrites are in there are fermented in the upper gut to nitrosamines right. so vitamin C stops that Right. And so it's a low carb diet. So I eat lots of bacon. I love salami. Um, I love processed meats. Have no concerns with that whatsoever. Right. So he's done an absolutely brilliant job. Uh, and early on, you said he'd been diagnosed with ME. Again, this is one of the things that drive me nuts with the medical profession, because ME is not a diagnosis. It's a clinical picture. A diagnosis gives you the reason why they've got that. So somebody might have the clinical picture of a pneumonia, but the actual diagnosis will be a pneumococcal pneumonia requiring this antibiotic or whatever. ME is not a diagnosis, it's a clinical picture. And it's a clinical picture characterised by poor energy delivery mechanisms um, and inflammation. And in his case, his inflammation is driven by Epstein-Barr virus. Now, if, and this is a very common way that ME presents, I should think about a fifth of the patients who come and see me, it's... Um, Interestingly, often starts with dairy allergy and recurrent tonsillitis, and then they get their Epstein-Barr virus, and then that switches them into their ME. So we have to tease that apart, and, and um, he's done a great job because the starting point is always to improve energy delivery mechanisms. Because if you can improve energy delivery mechanisms, then suddenly the immune system's got the energy that it needs to fight the virus. Right. And, you know, I'm very mindful I've got lots of people with Epstein-Barr-driven illness well, by paying no attention to antimicrobials to, to reduce the load of Epstein-Barr virus, simply by improving energy delivery mechanisms. And the preferred fuel of the immune system are ketones. That's what it likes to run on. And so you're going to massively improve your immune function uh, simply by doing a ketogenic diet. 
And his other question was, what is your main or your, I suppose, your go-to meal? Well, these days I tend to do intermittent fasting. So I don't, these days I don't have breakfast. I'm changed. I mean, I'm old and I'm female. I'm allowed to change my mind. Of course. And, and as we age, we all have to toughen up on our regimes. We, know, we all know it's a war we're going to lose, but if I lose it when I'm 120, then I'll settle for that. That sounds perfectly reasonable so. to me. <laughs> so uh, at the moment I intermittent fast. So at lunchtime, I usually have um, two eggs. Uh, and I've got ducks in the garden, so it's duck eggs, oh, with no. a couple of slices of my keto bread. And then my evening meal, at the moment, I've got artichokes in the garden. I have that with French dressing. And then I have meat. I have my own pigs. And I do swapses locally for beef and lamb. So it'll be a stew or whatever with, yes, my roast, my lovely roasted potatoes. And I've got French beans at the moment and some salad. And then my pudding is always the same. It's berries from the deep freeze. And again, I'm lucky. I'm a gardener. So it's full of gooseberries and blackberries and blackcurrants and so on with a dollar for my um, coconut, coconut cream. cream. Oh, and guess what? That takes... 30 seconds to prepare my, because I just take it out yes. of the deep freeze, put the coconut cream in, mix it round, the coconut cream goes slightly solid, the berries go slightly soft, so you end up with a nice cream effectively. Mm. Wow. So I'll have ice cream for pudding every evening. Good gracious, <laughs> there you go. And look at you, incredibly slim, not overweight, and um, radiant and healthy. So. I thought you were going to say it takes you 30 seconds to eat it. So. Oh, and Probably well, does. again, I'm a greedy pig, but if you eat things slowly, that helps with the addiction side of the thing, because the interesting thing about addiction is it's not the total dose of, of addiction that you have that gives you um, the hit. It's the rate of increase. Yeah. So the reason that the heroin addicts inject intravenously is because they like that hit when things come up very quickly. Yes. The reason the alcoholics like to drink very quickly on an empty stomach is because alcohol is rapidly absorbed and you get that hit to the brain. Right. So, and it's the same with sugar and carbohydrates. If you gobble your food, if you eat quickly, you get a rapid rise in blood sugar, and that's the addictive hit that we're looking for. And as I said, I'm an addict. I could happily be an addict. So these days, I deliberately make myself eat more slowly. That's, that's so interesting, because Julia will uh, attest to how I usually eat very rapidly. And because of that, I te was, not so much now, because I think my stomach has shrunk, as they say, whether it really shrinks, I don't know how that, what, that that's true or not. But I eat less now, or fewer big meals. Mm. Whereas before, because I was eating rapidly, you'd still go, oh, you know, I can eat seconds and, and thirds because yes. I didn't feel. But I found that eating more slowly, yeah, yeah. I actually get full up. Or, or, or even if I finished and I think, oh, I could eat some more. I, I found myself saying, no, just wait a minute and see in a few minutes whether you do want to eat more. Yep. And then I go, actually, no, I'm, I am replete. And also the business of chewing food is so important for the gut. There is a wonderful character called Horace Fletcher who was dubbed the great masticator. <laughs> and he uh, 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 had great success treating people with digestive disorders just by telling them to chew their food and to eat slowly. You know, as Gandhi said, you know, we should swallow our liquids and uh, we should chew our liquids and, and uh, drink our solids, i.e. chew, 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 until everything goes down as a liquid. And the business of chewing stimulates gut motility. It stimulates uh, production of stomach acid, of pancreatic enzymes. Of, you know, it's, it gets the whole gut lined up. And the business of digestion starts in the mouth. We don't just um, digest starches in the mouth. We digest proteins and fats as well from the from the enzymes from amylase. So chewing food is really really important, and it, it's we, we we're better at digesting, and therefore there's less chance of foods being fermented because they're more quickly absorbed. So chewing is really important. It just goes to show, doesn't it? It is. It, it, it all comes back to the most simplest things. We've overcomplicated yes. so much of what we do in this modern world. Correct. And. And, we, and our so-called sophisticated and intelligent ways of doing things very much is, is, is a mask, really, to what is... I'm a great advocate of the KISS principle, keep it simple, simple sweetheart. Stupid. Oh, yeah. Well, stupid, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm much like more polite than you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we'll go that one. <laughs> and the basic things done really well get you an awful long way there. Now, I see lots of people um, for all sorts of reasons, um, but most of them are fatigue syndromes. And I've had many who've come to me and they've, they've been diagnosed with, I've got Lyme disease, or I've diagnosed with that bar, and they've gone to America and they had the intravenous antibiotics and they had all these polluting treatments and they are no better. And the reason is they haven't put the basic stuff in place. Because the starting point to treat any infection is to stop feeding it with sugar.
Yes. Bacteria and yeast can only run on sugars and carbohydrates, and viruses love them too. Diabetics, for example, often present with an infection. They present recurrent chest infections, recurrent skin infections, recurrent urinary tract infections. Why? Because they're oozing sugar into their lungs and their skin and their urinary tract and feeding infection. So the starting point for any chronic disease, and, and um, I wrote a book called The Infection Game, and the nice thing about reading books, writing books is it really makes you research your subject well. And I couldn't find a pathology, I couldn't find a cancer or a heart disease or a dementia that didn't have an infectious associate. Mm. And it may well be that part of the mechanism by which sugars and carbohydrates drive all these pathologies is they encourage these bacteria, these viruses, these yeasts, which are associated with and possibly causal um, in the case of cancers and heart diseases and, and whatever. So sugar and carbohydrates really are the big bad guy. And that is absolutely the starting point to treat anything and everything. I do remember a book called The um, Pure White... And Simple. And yeah, and deadly, and, pure, and de and deadly. pure white and deadly. deadly yeah. I forget the name of the doctor. Yudkin, was it Yudkin? That's it. John yes, Yudkin. yes. Mm, mm. And that came out in something like the seventies, and, right. and, and I've got a reprint of it on the, on my shelf. And uh, I read a bit of that back in the seventies, and that was it for me. And I got off sugar, took it out my tea, and all those sort of things. It didn't stop me eating chocolate bars, and I and I had this Let's one see. thing where. I used to go off to, I used to do regular extra work on the bill in Thames Television, the bill for a period of my life. Every time I filled up with petrol, I would buy a bar of chocolate, which I think is what a lot of people do yes. still. Yes, indeed. And over time, I realised how much weight I was putting on. Not gross weight, but just significant. And I came to the conclusion it had to be the chocolate, and I stopped that, and it all fell off. And I found the biggest surprise, and Julia told me that she thought I was wasting away, was a couple of years ago when I stopped eating bread. Wow. wow. And, and within a couple of months, yeah. it, you, yeah. you, you, you were sort of, right down. you thought I was going to disappear down the drain yeah. pipe. I was, I was so, quite worried. Uh, uh, so there you go, sugar and carbohydrates. And, 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 and you obviously swap for chocolate, which is obviously not so good, but I have one girl who decided to swap it for fruit. She thought fruit was the healthy alternative and she became a fruitaholic. And she presented to her physicians, she, had, she developed abscesses in her armpit that then grew and grew and grew till she had these huge carbuncles there. Mm. And she'd had endless antibiotics, um, intravenous antibiotics, surgery, until they dare not operate more for fear of damaging the brachial plexus. And at that point she came to me. Nobody had asked about her diet. Oh, my she goodness. was eating lots of fruit, fruit juice and sugar. And I said to her, we're going to stop all that. So keto diet, obviously, and then I said, and paint that area with iodine, neat Lugol's iodine twice a day, keep it stained yellow. Now she came in the August, it was just before I was going around my long distance ride. By the um, Christmas, her axilla had entirely healed with no antibiotics, just simple keto diet, uh, vitamin C and a painting with lots of iodine. And that was miraculous because she thought she was going to lose her arm. <laughs> Good God. Well, there you are, ladies and gentlemen. This lady is uh, a marvel, and thank you so much for coming and and talking to us. We're so uh, blessed to have stumbled across those videos with the old snoop pipes, which oh, you still do so those. please, fantastic! You do that. And, and the, the, the sunshine sugar, uh, that sugar. What am I saying? Salt, the salt, which we shall go and uh, and buy some. I will send you some. Um, and um, and of course your wonderful books, the vitamin C. So we hope that people have got something out of this uh, incredible conversation. Thank you for coming here My pleasure. Uh, to visit us. And, and thank you for uh, everything you've done up yeah. to this point. My pleasure. And My at some point pleasure. it would be lovely to come and see your farm and your pigs and see, see of all of that. It would be fantastic. We've made such interesting contacts and friends now through the, the, um, this weird time that we've come in and, in. and we've said this so many times now that actually, you know, it's... Although it was a bad thing, in a way it's been a wake-up call for a lot of people to improve their health yes. and think about where they want to be in life. So, Dr. Sarah Myhill, thank you so much. My pleasure. You're a delight to talk to, both of you. We've, we've enjoyed it. <laughs> so there wish, we go. I wish I'd had more to speak about. <laughs> just I'm, absorb, just, I'm just in awe. <laughs> just absorb it all in. Um, so there we go. I will be back with uh, more uh, interviews, uh, monologues and, and all of that. And occasionally lovely Julia will be there to do join us on The English Couple, our sort of sister station. But from our special guest today, Dr. Sarah Myhill, 
do check out the website and the links which we'll put there from all of us. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>